Good afternoon. Welcome to the session on the quest for green energy. I have with me a very distinguished cast. I, my name is Andrew Cave. I write about business for the Daily Telegraph of London. i um, been a business journalist for 30 years and also have written a lot for Forbes and written some books about business leadership. I have with me today uh, Geoffrey Clements, Chairman of the Commonwealth Infrastructure Partners at the United Kingdom, Dalip Dua, Chairman of Krishna Hydro Projects in India, Devin Narang, Managing Director of Syndicatum Sustainable Resource India, AJ Podder, Managing Director of Synergy Environics in India, Nalin Singh, Managing Director of Nasio Cultures Consultancy India. Thank you for joining me today and I thought we going to have a very good session. I thought I'd start, if people don't mind, by um, asking the populist question that I think sometimes gets asked about India and um, renewables is why does a nation like India with so much sun have so little solar energy? And uh, perhaps um, Devin would, would, would like to lead off with that one. Sure, Andrew. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, everybody. And uh, Andrew, I think you've asked a very important question. Uh, let me start by let, uh, telling the audience that today India has about 370,000 megawatts of installed uh, capacity in India, which is thermal, which is about 62.3%, nuclear about less than 2%, hydro about 12.5%. And then we have renewable energy, which is 87,000 megawatts, of which solar alone is 35,000 megawatts and wind is about 38,000 megawatts. Now, why, why aren't we doing more solar in India? Good question. For solar is a peaking hour uh, uh, generation. So for solar to sustain itself or wind, you need base load power. So whether we like it or not, India will continue to be dependent for the next couple of years on solar, on coal power or some so sort of a base load power till battery technology comes and becomes uh, viable, economically viable for a country like India. Second, if you looked at five years ago from now, India has really had a tremendous growth in solar. We are growing at about 10% uh, annually in solar. The government of India has the most transparent policy in terms of solar and wind, in terms of reverse bidding. So you decide, you quote a price, it's on the net, you, you get the tenders which Government of India take out or the capacities they take out. Most of them are backed by central government sovereign guarantees. Uh, so PPAs are, some of the PPAs are internationally bankable. Some of the state discount PPAs may not be internationally bankable. The uh, second aspect is that as any country would have, uh, let me give you the advantages first that uh, with the solar and wind sector expanding in India. This has attracted a lot of good capital, long term capital from countries like uh, uh, from pension funds, etc., from Canada, uh, uh, Australia, Singapore, etc. There are some impediments in increasing the solar overnight, one being the land. So in India, you know, acquiring land becomes a major issue. That's a time consuming process. So every tender which is awarded is generally given 12 months to 18 months for it to be commissioned. Then there are some tra transmission issues which Government of India is taking care of, uh, which is in terms of making sure that the transmission is ready when the plant is ready. So it is happening. It's a slow process, but I'm sure that we will achieve the 175 gigawatt target, which, are, which the prime minister in the country has set. Uh, lastly, I would like to say that with mobility, e-mobility coming in, 30% of uh, we expect by 2030 that 30% e-mobility would be in place, which would create further demand for solar. And hopefully in the next five to six years, there would be battery technology available, which would lead to more storage and therefore less dependence on coal power. Thanks, Andrew. Andrew, you are muted. Andrew, you are muted. 
apologies. Muted. I muted myself by accident, sorry. Um, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Devin. So, um, AJ, um, do you have any perspectives on on that and on on the, the general mix of um, renewables in India? Well, I don't have a perspective on that, but I have a perspective of what uh, green energy, when we talk about the quest for green energy, I feel that any energy which we term as green should be efficient and ecologically friendly. The generation and its use should be ecologically friendly. And uh, so I, if I may, I would like to speak about uh, something that we use a lot now, uh, which is the Wi-Fi. Unless somebody else wants to come in on the solar energy, then I can speak later. No, I, I think that that would be great. That, yeah. that, that, <laughs> so uh, if we look at the most amount of any kind of energy that is being used right now, is basically to power our various gadgets, which is really called as EMF, and uh, also the Wi-Fi, which drives, uh, which uh, we use for our mobile phones or our tablets or our all our computing devices, including artificial intelligence and everything coming. And they are transmitted by high tension lines. They're transmitted by mobile towers, boosters, and all of them generate what is called e-pollution, which is invisible. Now, uh, I don't know if you know that there is a disease called, uh, there's a condition called EHS, electro hypersensitivity, which has now started affecting almost 5% of the population of Sweden, where a person, when he is subjected to any Wi-Fi or EMF, his hands and body start shaking. Now, there is no cure to it. And as we are going to use more and more, we have to look at safe uses of technology. What technologies should be used and whatever are being used, how they can be made safer. So that's my perspective. And uh, I don't know whether any of you have read the four warnings on a mobile phone. We just start using it. So one is that all mobiles are tested for use of six minutes, usage of six minutes an hour. They are all supposed to be used with speaker phones or, uh, you know, with the earphones. They are all supposed to be kept at least 10 millimeters from the body at any given time. So all these things are not known to people. And we are all excessively, we are all using our gadgets for more than four or five hours every day. So the other concern that I have is that there is a lot of e-waste which is generated and which is going to be generated going forward. When we are talking about batteries, when we are talking about lithium batteries, when we are talking about computers, mobile phones, nobody really knows how this e-waste is disposed or what is done with it. I personally know that in India and many other countries, e-waste is burnt. And that is also one of the causes of uh, pollution. So this is what I would like to say initially. And then I have something on 5G, which I can come to later. Thank you. That was very interesting. I, I had no idea about the, the Swedish uh, illness. I will look that up. That's, 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 that's very concerning. Um, Dalip, would you like to talk about um, hydro now as another important source of renewables in India? Yeah. Uh, I am really thankful to Horaces. Namaste, Horaces. The activities of hydro are well known in the world, but on 22nd March, when Honorable Prime Minister Mr. Modi called for a Janta curfew and there was a grid drop down in the evening, the solar and the wind, but the hydro was the biggest savior on 22nd March and our plants in India, NHPC was one of the leading organizations which really took over the grid drop and finally brought the grid back in 10 minutes. It's, it's hydro is a big savior in, in all the times and I think hydro needs more attention. And the biggest point of hydro in India was that it has been given a must run status. So economy and the, the employment opportunity 
infrastructure i think hydro is of immense importance but how do we get hydro better in india i think the fossil fuel cess fund which was taken up as a green fund is a huge money which is lying unused for the green revolution i think that should be taken up the second is the push of small hydro where some projects are stuck up it is easy to be done so they should be taken up at a faster pace then the innovative public private partnership model and today when we are talking about the bilateral relationships getting more dynamic and the relationships are going to be little geopolitical centric also so there is going to be lot of diverse uh, development of g to g activities and i think hydro has always been a kind of regional activity development and the best example you could see argentina parag and the brazil putting up a, one of the biggest uh, projects there and i think we really need to look at hydro in a different way in india the hybrid solar and pump storage is one of the most important new innovative thinking what government of india is taking on and i think we should look at in a much better way and by doing so by putting pump storage we are actually getting away with the disaster of flood and improving irrigation and i think the uttar pradesh and bihar needs the pump storage in a very big manner and it will be a big dynamic change in the infrastructure of india if we bring these things up in hydro thank you thank you very much um nelin um can I, can I ask you to talk about about your your sector of renewables so i work in the startup space mostly right and uh, in the funding space uh, i heard some important points here the way we generate uh, energy uh, is an existential issue now and uh, ajay mentioned that as well diseases etc and all that uh, having said that we are yet to find a way that is not going to challenge us in some way hydro the number of people it has displaced and the devastation it has caused to the mountains of india is amazing solar wind land grab the, you talk of uh, nuclear danger you talk of fossil fuel you look at the obvious pollution every what thing has got risks you can package it anyway you can tell me beautiful stories of how this is more important for humanity than anything else but the fact is it has an ecological and a human impact whichever way you uh, generate it if you look at the startup space this whole space of alternate energy has generated 15 green unicorns across the world out of the 350 unicorns that are there it is very exciting for the youth they get a romanticized view of how they're going to save the world from all the pollution etc but what they don't realize is that they're up against a cabal of people who are only interested in the land the payback and huge mega projects and not interested in local solutions for local economies that is why that is the big problem and the big fossil fuel generators with the biggest polluters and of course now the poor nations are trying to catch up and pay for the sins of the richer ones by going green etc etc the uh, the the, the uh, biggest polluters are now getting a green makeover you know like a facelift they open accelerators and incubators for the youth to start doing uh, coming up with new technologies they have no intention of taking it forward absolutely none because billions of dollars are already sunk into projects in the last 70 years to the latest 10, 10 years there's no way anybody is going to write it off for a startup guy it does not make sense to enter this vc funding has dropped to a sixth of what it was 10 years ago why it doesn't make uh, sense you have no control on the pricing you have no control on the transmission and the upfront costs are deliberately kept so high that it's a big man's game played between a set club of industrialists and politicians and land is the main thing in question here so it's not interesting for start was back to andrew that's quite depressing isn't it um jeffrey what what's your perspective from from the uk i mean you travel greatly but watching all this um develop from the uk what would be your perspective on 
on some of these issues. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, firstly, thanks very much to Frank and the Horasis organisers. This is, I had the pleasure, this is my sixth Horasis event, the first one virtually, which is a great pleasure, actually. Pleasure meeting everybody. Um, reflecting what everybody said uh, in so far, I, I visit India frequently. I spend about half my time in India. And this sector, the solar and renewable sector, is an area that I'm very interested in and participated in. Just drawing together some of the things that are points that have been made so far. Um, storage is obviously very, very important. Otherwise, renewables will never be completely uh, reliable, sustainable and able to provide the stability of power supply. Uh, in addition to batteries, there's some very interesting innovations taking place. For example, industrial scale hydrogen fuel cells, a company just up the road from me has got some very interesting uh, innovations there where a one meter cube uh, can store, can generate 50 kilowatts of, uh, of power from hydrogen. So that's one thing that we should look into. I won't, obviously, because of time, won't dwell on that in too much detail. The next is innovation. If you can innovate in your solar technology, um, the, there's a lot of work being going on at the moment in thin film technology, CIGS, for example. Um, a colleague of mine at London South Bank University is doing a lot of pioneering work in that. Let's say if you could improve the efficiency by 1%, then you can either increase your output by 1% or decrease your land usage by 1%. So there are the actual the level of efficiency of your solar units is very, very important. And this is something I think that needs to be dwelt on uh, in a very important way. The next is the regulatory issues. I, I talk quite a lot to the people at SECI, the Solar Energy uh, Corporation of India, uh, part of MNRE, and... They're quite frank that some of the bids that are going out are unsustainable economically. Um, I've been, I probably shouldn't say this, but I've been told in confidence that people say, how could this bid actually ever be profitable for anyone bidding for this project? That has to be looked at. But I think the most important issue is self-sufficiency and resilience. Uh, from a global economics point of view, obviously things are going to change. Uh, from India's point of view, the the massive changes that are absolutely necessary with regard to its relationship to China, the very unfortunate incidents, but not only that, looking at globally what is happening in terms of supply chain. That is going to say, take some time to do, to create complete self-sufficiency and a whole life cycle approach in the generation of not only solar, but every other sector. Um, the other, I just mentioned headlines here because of time. We need to look at dual use. People have looked at land. Uh, dual usage, uh, solar and waterways, solar and agriculture, and also the importance of off-grid and local networks, which are very important in the, especially a country as large as India, to make sure that energy supply can reach everywhere. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, maybe we should look at some of the external factors um, and what effect they might have. The oil price, um, it would be interesting to know the views of the panel on how low, how much lower oil has to go to to address some of these um, investment issues that Nelian was talking about. And also, um, how... how um, how much still needs to be done? I mean, what, what realistic chances does India have of meeting the deadline for the S SDGs? And are there any particular um, ones of those which is going to meet faster? Um, and why? Who, who can, um, who's happy to talk to that? Let you want me to go, Andrew? Yeah. Uh, okay. Can I just have a shot at this? Sorry, there were just two questions which came up, uh, which I thought I'd quickly answer. One is about the grid. Uh, can it be localized? I think by Mr. Joshi. Answer is yes. Uh, they can be done. It is being done and that could be done. The second question is, as uh, uh, a lot of people know, that uh, yesterday Government of India has decided that a lot of the discoms, state utilities are going to be privatized. 
so as we move forward we will see a lot of privatization in this sector and down the value chain third um, interesting points being raised now coming specifically whether this sector is attracting capital uh, certainly not uh, as startups uh, but yes as operating projects uh, it is attracting huge amount of capital billions of dollars are flowing into the renewable energy sector both solar and wind and fourth yes we are looking at different alternatives offshore wind tenders have been given going forward we would have hybrid tenders of solar and wind and other forms of renewable energy coming into play thank you andrew andrew can i take a make a comment on that yes please do firstly i agree with what he said and uh, india has never been more serious than it is now about what it's doing in this space uh real uh, political brains are being spent things are being liberalized etc but a couple of points one on the supply side with this uh, rightful uh, jingoism about uh, our neighbor uh, i don't see how you will do solar energy when all your equipment comes from there including the cells virtually all of it so unless you want to shoot yourself in the foot and go back 10 years nothing's going to happen over there if you uh, you know start uh, playing out that uh, narrative the second thing is that you know there is a lot of money into renewable energy he's right in the startup space not so because it requires a lot of patient capital and virtually uh, lifelong capital multi life capital it needs political capital hence people shy away because they want returns coupled with the uh, you know uh, bureaucratic uh, cholesterol in the system and uncertain pricing uncertain laws and the political politicians hold on the large projects there's no space for young startup people so while we are expanding so capacity expanding i would like to question what technology are we expanding on this is technology that was there 30 years ago all the latest innovation is not incorporated in this te- is in these technologies old people with old money playing an old game and now giving it scale there is no breath of fresh air in this except for a few startups outside of india Could I, could I just add a point on the SDGs, Andrew? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, this, I think this is crucial with regard to the sector that we're dealing with today, green energy. Um, if you look at the conventional energy, then it, it's very difficult to spread adequate supply to the whole population. And the SDGs are all about healthcare, education, uh, social welfare, education. Um, Uh, people having a minimum uh, standard of living and so forth and i think that and this is something i've looked at in in various projects i've been involved with um, in different parts of india in gujarat for example one of the uh, best universities technology universities there is looking at how uh, solar energy local local grid solar bio hydro uh, and other forms of renewable energy can really help to solve the problems that are experienced at a local level particularly in the outlying regions which may be almost impossible to co- connect to the grid uh, this um, many of you will know about the initiatives of the confederation of indian industry their urban rural outreach for example and to make that effective you have to have reliable energy out in the rural areas and that enables um, health at a, healthcare at a distance education at a distance access to the markets for the people living in the rural communities so i feel that the whole issue and topic that we're dealing with here in green energy um and a green economy is vital for all of the other goals set in the sdgs you are muted andrew yeah sorry does anybody have a view on how low oil has to go how much lower further it has to fall to make um some of these investments sufficiently attractive um can i can take a shot at that andrew i don't think we have oil currently is playing a very important role in the growth of solar or uh, wind in india or renewable energy in india uh, oil prices have been fluctuating uh, uh what will the future pan out we don't know but i think the the important question here as nalin has said is the return on capital employed 
So as long as you are min- you have a return on capital employed, be it for pension funds who have a lower threshold, or for an equity player, or for a family office who is expecting a certain stable return, or for an industry who wants to be renewable, but is uh, uh, and wants a renewable uh, sitting on his balance sheet. I don't think the price of oil oil becomes uh, is so relevant at the moment. And as Jeffrey said, I think what is important for us is to speed up the installation of plants, be it by using new technologies which require uh, less land, or go and going into areas where grid is not possible is something which is happening. But people have to understand we are a large country, 1.2 or 1.3 billion people, and it's increasing as population increases as we talk. Uh, so I think it is relevant. that we take we use technology which are relevant for india in both in terms of costs and in terms of technology yes we are dependent upon china but hopefully indian entrepreneurs are setting up plants in india and the next two years we will see solar modules being prepared in india uh, as we speak i know of international companies who are coming into india to set up solar module plants so it's just a matter of time uh, that these uh, technologies will come in we can always pick up modules from the us uh vietnam or from malaysia thank you is there a role for government uh, is 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 the more the government should be doing to to kick start innovation particularly um who would like to talk about that please yeah, yeah. Uh, so actually uh there is as far as innovation is concerned which nalin was also talking about that maybe uh, on the generation there are the old uh, interest and there's the kapal and everything but i think there can be a lot of uh, innovations for bringing in more efficiency in the usage in the uh, like of course like we've had in lighting and things like that but there are many things like in computing in other things where or even in making these technologies safer the technologies are talking about i think somebody is not muted anyway so i think uh, there can be a lot of innovation in this sphere where for making all these technologies safer for example uh, just to give you a small example that Elon Musk has now invented the solar roof and the solar tiles which so that means that you are you don't need to necessarily use panels and you can use you can build a house and it's a one time thing and you can it becomes a perpetual generator of uh, energy but if somebody was to ask you would you sleep in a room with a generator in that room obviously the answer would be no so you got to make these technologies you got to make whatever is good there may be a lot of things but you need a lot of innovations to make it safer and there are safety innovations which are available which the governments need to encourage and take on board thank you um anybody else on why there isn't more innovation and what what can be done to stimulate it so i think if you look at uh, you know the whole sector from the start because of the high capex need it was always the government who set up these plants and they took the leadership they have the transmission facilities etc when they tried to open it up the first principle of any privatization is free pricing uh there is no free pricing the client has no say in it he can't pick a uh, one uh, option of energy versus the other he or she cannot pick what price it is coming at and uh, the whole thing is reads needs a rethink because the same same kind of plants same kind of technology uh, then you are taking baby steps in innovation for for the real innovation to come a lot of these uh, young people need to be heard the kind of thing they are doing is absolutely amazing but where will the scale they can't even test it at scale because everything is state controlled largely and if it is uh, private controlled those players are so large that they have no access to them they put keep them in small accelerators like a, you know incubation box and make sure the technology and the idea dies there 
Yeah. Andrew, on the innovation part, I would like to say that innovation is not into the innovation what is primacy in the future, but what is existing, you improvise on that also. So that is also innovative. And if you're looking at innovation uh, through hydro, hydro to hydrogen, that's the future in India. How do you can do that? That's an important aspect. And uh, to generate hydrogen, the cheapest power and the fastest power can be uh, hydro. So why can't we have a combination of hydrogen and hydro together? That is an innovative project. Secondly, on the capex part, the hydro has been saving, uh, is being on a back burner seat because of the high potential capital investment. Now, when the Western world can look at the leasing models and higher purchase things, in hydro, if we get into higher purchase and leasing model of equipment, I think the biggest climate funds or the funds which can be non-risk takers or they are averse to risk, only funding the in engineering part, only funding the machines, it, it is uh, taking away 30% of the equity cost and you are still an innovative in doing a hydro plant. The capex comes down and you take your returns through the generation. And it's innovation. It's, it's, it's a new innovative instruments to finance the capital at a lower cost is also innovation. So we should consider not the future. Storage is one part in solar, but pump storage with hydro is a green battery. Why can't we look at green battery for India? So that is the most important aspect, innovative. Thank you. Andrew, if I may jump into this, please. Yeah, so one question I just wanted to respond to Benjamin was that uh, using blockchain. Uh, yes, uh, there is a lot of trading of uh, renew renewable energy uh, credits being done on blockchain by a lot of international companies, uh, a lot of companies out of Singapore. So that is coming. That's innovation. Second thing, I think uh, all my esteemed panelists should know are, and are aware of the new Electricity Act, which has been drafted now in India, which will allow open access. Going into the future, you would have more of open access. So you can choose what form of energy you want to produce. Open access will lead to innovation because cost will become very important. It become important for an entrepreneur or a big business house. It doesn't matter who you are to actually produce the power at the cheapest price. And therefore, innovations will come in and innovations will attract capital. Now, let me third point very quickly. As we set up our solar plants, which I also own, you have seen a lot of young entrepreneurs who've come in, maybe for operation and maintenance or for cleaning or innovative cleaning of modules. That is also innovation. Uh, people have also actually uh, innovated how to now grow crop between two lines of uh, two rows of solar modules. Uh, low, uh, this thing so that you can do actually organic farming along with this. So there are, you know, innovation is a very wide word. Uh, India gives you the opportunity of scale. I think people must not forget that when LED bulb journey started and when Piyush Goel, uh, our Honorable Minister of the Minister for MNRE uh, Renewables, uh, Indian market was X amount. Today it is 300 to 400 million LED bulbs in a year. The prices come down from 500 rupees to 35 rupees. That has enabled global capacities to come up in India and overseas. So India is an ideal place for someone to demonstrate technology and get scale. Thank you. Jeffrey, do you have anything to add on innovation? Yes, I, I, in fact, I just want to pick up uh, on a point that David just made and another members of the panel, that when we look at innovation, um, there's a risk, and that risk um, occurs, is actu activated very often, that you look at things in a very fragmented way. Now, when you want to look at sustainability of energy supply, you have to look at the infrastructure that that energy is supplying to. And all too often, we're looking at old, inefficient infrastructure, and even new infrastructure that is not fit for purpose. You drive through Gurgaon or Nabi Mumbai and you see places which are subjected to over 40 degrees centigrade with south facing walls of glass. Now, that is not the most efficient use of energy. And there have been some very good projects. For example, there was the Solar City project in Gandhinagar a few years ago where we 
we looked at the master plan that the, if you're looking at energy, you're not just looking at energy production, but what happens to that energy once it is produced? Where is it going to? Um, we could save probably 20% of energy if we designed our buildings more properly, uh, if we restored the older infrastructure to be more fit for purpose. Uh, in the thread of questions just now, there was something about um, buildings and so forth. BIPV, building integrated uh, photovoltaic, uh, local grids, um, having building, uh, I mean, look at large car parks, for example, where you can create shade. Um, just mentioned, Devin, about combining agriculture and solar. Very important areas there. Placing solar over waterways to avoid or reduce evaporation and to minimize land use. There are many ways that we can not just look at innovation simply as how do you make better cells? How do you make your uh, supply and generation more effective? You have to look at the whole structure of your infrastructure locally and at a national level. And I think only in that way will we be looking at innovation in a global and comprehensive way. If I could jump in for a minute and then we can go for questions. Uh, so I agree with Jeffrey and Devin, uh, you know, a lot of uh, innovation uh, happening uh, to, at uh, all levels uh, and we need to look at it holistically. The point uh, the, I think of always is that the really, really large juicy piece in this is the generation, the land, the lease, etc. So the big guys hog that and they leave the tidbits for the innovators in the, at the bottom of the food chain. That you do the cleaning, you do the operations, you go grow grass. That's why the young are frustrated. It's a caste system. It's a class system. Thank you. Well, we've got quite a few questions. Um, let's take one from Neil, who says energy access solutions have often been deemed to be more expensive restrictive and an interim solution than people have to depend on until the national grid arrives. Do you see models like pay as you go playing a role in enabling this? Yeah, sure. So, you know, if you, if you're looking at this pay as you go model, uh, <clears throat> I know in some parts of the country, this has started. I know this is very, very prevalent in Africa where you pay as you go for electricity and the solar lamps only come on if you recharge your system through a mobile phone. Uh, that Those systems are yet to come to India. But again, government is thinking, uh, I don't know people are familiar with Manrega, that they would put money into the uh, customers or the poor person's account who would then pay for electricity. So these are all under development. Uh, it can be done in a smaller area, but a country like India definitely is a challenge. And pay as you go would come in, uh, but I think it will take some time for it to come in. And just on the rooftop bit, which there was a question, uh, again, uh, the rooftop is extremely successful in India. Different states have different laws. Uh, it is uh, it is moving moving uh, forward with uh, a very good pace, I must say. And uh, I, if I remember correctly, there there may be about thousand two thousand megawatts of rooftop uh, uh, solar already in operation, and more tenders are coming out. Uh, so so that that's what it, Neil is asking me a question that do you think pay as you go can help enable user ownership of renewable assets. Uh, well, as long as your payments are secure, you would get investments. Therefore, if you look at India, those state governments which which pay uh, regularly are the ones where investment goes in. Those who delay, and we very well know the rogue states. If I sorry, if I mention that, uh, their investments are not going. So as long as you can demonstrate the security of the investors' capital and return, sure. You're muted. Ajay, you're muted. Um, anyone else have anything to say on, on that one? Yeah, Andrew, I just wanted to make a point before time runs out. 
after if anybody wants to say on 5G because I think it's important for green energy. Can I? Five. Yes. Yes. So, there has been a lot of clamor for 5G and I think it's very important for the people to know that when we talk about 4G, it's about 4 to 6 gigahertz, the transmission range, but 5G is 60 to 300 gigahertz. And uh, even if it is required, for, because what is going to happen is this is going out of this low frequency, radio frequency radiation. And even if it is necessary technologically, then we must only go for wired technology, not the wireless ones. So that means that if you, something is generating 5G, if we need it for our installations like our laptops or like uh, large AI computing, but we should not use it for mobile technology because the moment it becomes wireless, even people who are not using it, the older people and all, and 5G was and is used for riot control and uh, warfare and things like that. So it is uh, quite dangerous. And if we are to use it, we must use it very carefully. That's the point I just wanted to make. Has anyone else got any final reflections? We have three minutes left. Well, um, there's one question, Andrew, on energy efficient buildings in India that's retrofitting and energy efficient buildings. Terry in India has done a lot of work on this uh, and uh, they have used geothermal for this. Uh, yes, this is the future. This would come in. And I'm also told that government would put a law into place that all future buildings have to be energy efficient as they've done in uh, 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 rain, uh, rain harvesting and to make it solar efficient. So existing buildings also uh, excellent, excellent opportunity. Just one final question for me. Um, was anybody wants to be brave enough to answer? Where do you think we'll be in ten years' time? Will we be still having this discussion, or will we be a lot further along? Or I mean, what what do you think is a medium term prospect for for, for this subject in India? Well, I think in ten years from now, uh, we we would be uh, much more renewables than what it is present, and considering that. Uh, India is growing, would continue to grow, except for this year. I think renewables is the future. Renewables is here to stay. So I, yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, 10 years from now, uh, one, we will be thankful that the government did what it did. And a lot of movement happened. But we will also look at what we created and wonder why we did not use the best technology available even at that time. I'm, I'm, my, my impression on this is that because of the current global situation, we will be obliged to make those changes. Um, it's the same with so many aspects of the way that the global and national economies have been working up until now. Air transport, for example, we have taken it for granted that things were, were developing and growing in a particular way. We now must reevaluate those. And I think it's very, we, uh, Frank has formed this oasis as the global vision community. Uh, it's been running for 15 years, and it does a great job of allowing leaders in thought to come together to see what we must be doing. So I think the question that you have just posed, Andrew, which I think is the most important question in the session, is that we have to throw that question back to ourselves. What can we do to make sure that the scene, the situation does change, not just in 10 years' time, but actually in the immediate future? And I think it it, it comes down to making sure that we take a comprehensive approach, not just looking at energy production through solar, energy production through hydro, the grid, not on off-grid and so forth. We have to look at the whole infrastructure. We have to look at national self-sufficiency and resilience to make sure that the, the nation, India, but it applies to all nations, can be completely self-sufficient in moving towards a green energy economy. Wonderful. Well, we have 20 seconds left, so we just have time for me to thank everybody. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Dalip. Thank you, Devin. AJ, Nalin. Thank you for all the people who have asked the questions. And it's been a very informative session, and we look forward to welcoming you to next year. Thank you. 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 Thank you.